we're very excited to announce the extension of Bauhaus typography at 100. So we, um, because of Delta, because of the pandemic, we've definitely heard some clamoring for um, keeping this show open longer and we're so excited to do so. So I believe we've added on about a month. Um, so get in now uh, while you can and um, if you haven't seen or heard of this yet and somehow have missed out on the Bauhaus, um, few design movements have shaped contemporary typography quite like the Bauhaus. It was founded by German architect Walter Gropius in 1919 and the school embraced tools of mass production and the creation of radical new art. Though the institution only lasted 14 years, its influence is immense. And over the last 40 years, um, the archive's founder, um, Rob Saunders, and executive director, Rob Saunders, has ex explored the school's unique legacy in, in graphic design through collecting artifacts of its own making, um, its books, its magazines, its course materials, its product catalogs, its stationery, its promotional flyers, um, and its other ephemera. So as well as the objects, um, as well as objects created by many characters before and after the time of the school. Um, the collection of his collected materials draw through line from the Bauhaus, um, the Bauhaus's ic uh, iconic style to the shape of typography today. So I'm sure many of you are here because you know of Rob, um, you know, or you know Rob, and you know this collection. So he probably doesn't need an introduction, but I'm gonna give him one anyway. Um, so Rob Saunders is a, our curator and um, he's letter from archives curator and publisher, Has is a designer, a teacher. He's teaching so much this week. He's a publisher, he's a management consultant who has been, who's collected graphic design um, and letter forms for over 40 years. He began his career teaching at the School of the Museum of Fine Arts Boston and Tufts University while serving freelance clients and agencies before founding a book publishing enterprise that included Alphabet Press, which was graphic design, Picture Book Studio, children's books, and Rabbit Ear Books, which is uh, book audio packages, which was eventually acquired by Sh Simon & Schuster. Prior to founding Letterform Archive, he served as a creative and marketing consultant with clients in hospitality, technology, and financial industries. Um, so without further ado, I give you Rob Saunders. Thanks, everybody. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. Um, I see we have a bunch of people, uh, some of whom I know and some of whom I've, I'm looking forward to meeting. Um, and um, I, I wanted to, so it turns out as I thought about this talk, um, it's kind of a weird topic. It, it implies certain things that aren't actually true, um, as I'll get into in a minute. Um, and I'm, I'm also not sure, like it would actually be great if, if folks could post in the chat because uh, I have some branches I could go down here and some of it is kind of more about um, uh, techniques of collecting. And I'm, I'm wondering whether that is actually of interest or whether it's more uh, just about the material and the, and the curation of it. Um, so I'm actually kind of prepared to talk a little about both. Um, but here's the reason that it's kind of not true. Um, I, uh, half and half, okay, well, that's, I'm not sure I have that much on, on, the, on, on how to do it. Uh, or maybe I don't wanna give you all my secrets. But um, uh, so it turns out when I looked into it, the first thing, that was acquired that is in this Bauhaus show was acquired in 1981. So the 40 years thing is legit. Um, and, but here's another interesting fact. 
I realized uh, walking through the show the other day that there are only, the show has 190 pieces in it. Um, and that's not counting duplicates of books and things which are there so that we can show covers and spreads. Um, and um, of those 190, I think maybe only about 20 were in the collection when the archive opened in 2015. So there's been a lot of um, growth in the Bauhaus stuff. Um, and it, it didn't, it wasn't actually built for a show. Um, it was one of the, a number of threads that we pulled on after we opened uh, to build out the collection in ways that seemed appropriate for the community. So, um, and then when we, um, when we were, got noticed that we were gonna have to move in 2019 and started to work on finding a space and, and planning the build out, and we knew we'd have a gallery, that's pretty much when we decided to do Bauhaus. And I started to aggregate all the material that was um, available at the time. And actually, I have to say, I remember um, Ellen Lupton came to visit right around the time I had most of the material aggregated in my office. And she gave me an hour and a half of her time um, looking through it together. And it was, um, it was just tremendously helpful. She's a, she's a great mentor. Um, and I'm really looking forward to her talk. She has much more, um, you know, sort of in-depth curatorial insight than you'll probably get from me. Um, but um, so there, you know, that means we acquired about 170 pieces of Bauhaus typography or Bauhaus related. Well, first of all, there are, there are sections of the show and which correspond to chapters in the book. Um, there's one called Towards a New Typography, and that is um, beyond Bauhaus in one sense. And then there's another um, chapter called Beyond the Bauhaus. And um, so those both are material that's kind of outside the scope of a real Bauhaus collection. Um, and a lot of that, some of that material was in the collection, uh, a bit more of it. Um, but, um, and, and the, one of the things that I think is kind of an interesting story is just that, that it continues, you know, I mean, once you've set Bauhaus as an alert term on a few key search aggregators and, um, um, you know, sort of dealer and auction aggregators, um, you're seeing pretty much the stuff that's flowing through the market. And there's a lot of it. And the, the anniversary, which, so the school opened in uh, 1919. So um, the 100th anniversary of the opening was a couple of years ago. The span of it, uh, it was open until 1933. And so it's only 14 years. Um, a key date for typographers really would have to be 1925 when they moved to Dessau and for the first time had type in the workshop. Um, prior to that, there was only printmaking and, um, uh, and also appointed the first master uh, of the typography and advertising workshop, which was uh, Maholi Naj. Um, and um, so I think, um, I, I, I'm, I'm gonna, let me do a screen share first because I wanna set some context. And actually um, I welcome questions along the way. Um, and um, Sarah, maybe you could read them to me though. Yeah, if, they, um, if folks type questions in the chat, um, great. If you wanna put it in the Q and A, great. I will read from both. Um, all right. Let me first do uh, a bit of a screen share. All right, is everybody seeing that? Yes, we good? Yes. Yes, okay. So um, 
this is just a brief slideshow of um, the installation of the show in our new gallery. Um, and um, it gives you a sense of how it's organized in the sections maybe, and, and also um, <laughs> the fact that the gallery is tiny. It's 20 by 30 feet, so 600 square feet. That's not a very large space. Um, some attention was paid to the fittings to maximize the capacity Sorry. For, for this kind of material. Ron, yes. Um, it says double click to enter full screen mode. We're seeing a screen, but. Um, oh, well, I am actually showing full screen here. Yeah. Are you seeing? Okay, hang on. Let me see if I can get that. You know, are you working on two monitors? No. Mm. Is that better? Oh, here we go. Yes, thank you. Oh, good, okay. I think it's just the sequence. I, I hit another, yeah, okay, cool. So we got the right thing on top now, which, um, yeah, let's see. So I was just saying that we, we spent some, we paid some attention to the fittings to um, make it, you know, we, we, we kind of, being a small gallery and also uh, with a lot of, um, you know, printed matter, which tends to be smaller and um, and not framed, or in some cases even easily frameable, um, uh, we we really didn't want to be in the business of of um, hiring museum preparators and framing and deframing for every show, and uh, nor building custom fittings, which is what museums often do. Um, and so um, we developed a system of, of horizontal and vertical vitrines. The vertical ones work by magnetism. And um, it's very space efficient and allows for stories to be told across the span of the vitrines and also flowing up into the vertical space. Um, so um, the wall at the end is kind of, uh, it cuts across all of the sections because it's basically just the poster wall. It's where the big stuff had to go. Uh, for the next show, there are more posters and there'll be more hanging panels and uh, fewer cases. And, um, uh, you know, I think the panels may be in an angle. There's a, there's a lot of flexibility in it. Um, oh, the people go away. Jeez, look at that. Okay. Um, so that gives you a sense of what the show looks like on site. Uh, there's, we would have done more, but there's only one iPad, but it has, it has page throughs of three of the, three of the coolest things. Um, and so now I have a few, um, this, this begins to get into collector stories. I, I shot this morning, some photographs of objects on, uh, in the context of the, of the show. Um, because of how they, they tell a story. Um, this is one of seven unique objects in the show. It's by Walter Duxell. Um, and it's a paste up for a poster. Um, and um, this was acquired um, at Swan Galleries, which is an auction house in New York that does um, uh, start out mainly as a book auction house, but um, now sells photographs and art and uh, posters and things. And uh, is one of the is is actually the only auction house that I know of in the world that is running graphic design shows. Um, they uh, started that a couple of years ago and they've done very well. And last year we tagged along with them and did uh, a fundraising auction from, uh, of duplicates from our collection um, uh, on the same day or the day before, I guess, uh, their, their annual um, graphic design auction. So this was in a swan sale some years ago. And I know the provenance of it, which is really kind of interesting and fun. It came to Swan from, um, there was a guy in New York, and oh shit, I forgot his name now. Oaklander was the name of the book uh, store. And it was just a rabbit warren of 
of many things, but a lot of depth in uh, graphic design and, and uh, archival artifacts and stuff, and, and also type specimens and things like that. And he, he passed away and, and Swan was selling his stuff and this was among it. But I also then found it in a Holstein catalog from Berlin in the 80s, which is interesting because one of the other objects that's coming up in the slideshow is in that same Holstein catalog, but came to us in a very different way. Um, by the way, you're, you're also welcome to raise your hand in the chat and say, this is boring, please move on. Um, I'm not really, uh, I, I'm sort of figuring out how to address this topic. So um, this is the other object that was in that Holstein catalog. It was a thick Bauhaus catalog. It's still a reference. I actually, I, I put it under the camera if I had it in my office, but I think it's upstairs. We used it as a reference. It's one of those dealer catalogs that is kind of a definitive statement of a, of a movement. And especially at a time when a lot of stuff, interesting stuff was available. Um, so this piece is another unique object in the show. It's a watercolor and collage uh, book presented to a new member of the Bauhaus community done by Felix Clay, who was at the school, Paul Clay's son. And um, just a wonderful and fascinating and kind of early expressionistic uh, Bauhaus piece. So both of these pieces were in that same Holstein catalog. One came to us through Oaklander to Swan. Um, and the other one landed in the Sackner collection, which you can and should Google probably. It was, um, I suppose still is, the largest collection of concrete poetry uh, and sort of text-based art of various kinds. Um, there's a couple, Marvin and, and Ruth Sackner, who lived in Miami. And some of it ended up in a museum, the Perez Art Museum in Miami. Some of it, the bulk of it, landed at the University of Iowa, um, partly because they have an amazing data collection. So um, the Sackners had this. And I saw it there in Miami. And I was offered it um, because by then, Ruth had passed on and Marvin was starting to sell the collection off in pieces. And, uh, but Marvin's prices were like crazy high. And uh, I, I ended up basically saying no to everything he offered. I probably, I, this is maybe should be off the record, um, but um, it ended up in an, in an auction in Berlin. And, um, so it landed here. Um, I think this is kind of interesting, right? Two objects, different artists, same dealer catalog in Berlin in the 80s, both landed here. And we can pretty much trace where they were. Um, I, I don't know. That, this, this shit fascinates me. I, I'm not sure if it's, if it's uh, of interest to you. Um, one of the things that... that uh, happened because we kind of had some momentum in acquiring this stuff and people knew it. So there was stuff that kind of came out of the woodwork as we were, even as we were preparing the show, as we were hanging the show. The first cut really was the things that didn't make the book. And so this next little batch of slides, I'm gonna show you some things that, that came in after the book went to press, but before the show was hung. So they made the show, but not the book, they'll be in the second edition, if there is one. Um, in fact, this cover of the Bauhaus book catalog by Maholi Naj is in the book because it we licensed it for the timeline, I think. Um, and then we subsequently acquired it. Um, this is also not in the book, and this came from Swan last year, um, you know, we, we um, our, our sale raised $145,000 uh, on Wednesday and, and we spent a bunch of it on Thursday. This, this was um, in that Swan sale 
I don't actually know the provenance of this, but I do know that there are three boards of Buyer's Universal Alphabet, original ink uh, and paste up boards like this. Um, the other two are at Harvard and came to them through the Gropius collection. I haven't been able to trace provenance further, but um, on this, and, and I'm kind of working on it because I'm curious. Um, it's very cool. It's, it's a little bit quirky. Uh, there's a better known version that's usually reproduced. In fact, this one was reproduced in PM Magazine uh, uh, in the 40s when Bayer landed in the US. Um, this also arrived after the book closed. This is um, an original collage by Eric Komariner done as in, the, in Maholi Naj's preliminary course. And um, this we know, this was exhibited in Germany uh, in the 80s and there's a published catalog with it. Um, and that show traveled a bit, I forget. Um, and um, I don't actually know about the in-between bit, um, but we acquired it at auction recently. Um, these two buyer uh, invitations for Bauhaus parties, the White Festival on the upper right and the uh, Bauhaus Spiele, I'm not sure what that is, um, are by Herbert Beyer. And they were also in the, the Swan Sale. Um, and there's something you need to know about the White Fest because everybody assumes that it's uh, faded. It's not. He added white to all the inks because it's the White Festival. Um, and it's very, uh, it's very clean that there is a lot of white, uh, but everything else is, is, uh, has, has white added to the ink. Um, this also came in after the book went to press. This is uh, Oscar Schlemmer's uh, program for the 1923 exhibition. And um, so this is kind of an interesting, um, Segue. I hope I can find the theatrical. Um, sorry, I'm looking for something for the camera. All right, well, um, so let's talk about the Bauhaus postcards. Maybe, um, well, actually, no, I'm going to, I'm going to unshare. I think I have to stop share and then reshare. Um, I want to change the focus to the browser. Okay, cool. Are we seeing uh, a full browser? Yes, we're seeing that. Thank you. Okay, good. So um, this is the object that um, is in the show that, that I acquired the longest time ago. That's not a sentence, but whatever. Um, so this was acquired in 1981. And, and in the early years when I started collecting, um, a lot of collectors, they put a, a kind of a, a code in the back of things so that they can remember, uh, you know, when and from whom and for how much they acquired it. This one actually has the price on the front. So this is the first specimen of Futura, which um, interestingly was not ever used by the Bauhaus. The Bauhaus never got Futura during its run and it used other sans serif typefaces, but the new typography that came out of um, Futura uh, was very much part of the Bauhaus tradition. So in fact, the price is here.
Here it is. Can you see that? It's five dollars. Uh, the the code on the back actually says it says 1981, and it says that it was a a dealer in Connecticut named the Emersons who used to have a lot of type specimens and uh, books about printing. Um, and, uh, but what I actually paid was $3 and 46 cents because I bargained them down on a lot. And uh, there were about, I don't know, 20 or 30 really great ephemeral type specimens in that lot. Um, and so, um, yeah, that's, um, this now goes for, you know, I don't know, one to 2000, I suppose, if it's complete. Um, and time does that, but it also goes the other way. You know, I mean, uh, one of my other passions is, is Dwiggins. And um, I built my Dwiggins collection in the 80s when he was pretty popular and, and the internet didn't exist. Um, if I'd waited to do it, until the aughts, I would have done it at like half the half the cost. Um, so I have some other tabs here, and let me just make sure that I can switch. Um, this is um, a link. Maybe somebody could post this. This is this is Wired magazine um, uh, on Bauhaus postcards at the time that that MoMA acquired their set, which was in 2015, I think. Yeah, 2015. And um, well, I guess there used to be more images in this. I guess they don't, they don't show them all. Um, but there, so that's basically to give you a sense of how rare uh, a set of Bauhaus postcards is um, they they don't come on the market very often, and um, uh, MoMA didn't have one until 2015, which I think is is kind of significant. I'm sure they had a few of the cards. Everybody had that, and and in fact, I was working on a set and had about um, I don't know six or seven of them. Um, whichever ones ended up in our sale, um, because the, uh, what happened is in the anniversary year, there were a bunch of dealer catalogs and auction sales of Bauhaus material of all kinds, not just uh, design and typography, but uh, uh, everything. And um, there was a set of Bauhaus postcards um, at auction in, in Berlin. And um, I was an underbidder. I, I wasn't even the underbidder. I was like way down in the pecking order. Um, I made an attempt for it soon after the opening and just and then just kind of gave up. And but I know the auctioneer pretty well. And um, after the sale, he sent me an email and he said, "How would you like a set of nineteen of them?" for about half what they went for yesterday. <laughs> and because he knew of a, a collector in Paris that had them. And um, of course that was an auction record and, and I didn't feel like chasing it. Um, so um, we haggled a bit and, um, and so that's how they landed here. But, um, you know, Actually, sir, if you could spotlight the camera now, I'm gonna. Sure, I got it. So to, to um, explain this, I'm just gonna use our uh, facsimile set. Um, these are the Bauhaus postcards. And this one, which is number 10 by Rudolf Bachand, uh, is the one that we don't own. Um, I'm sorry, Rob, I think you need to stop sharing for the spotlight to work. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Is that working now? Yes. Thank you. Cool. Okay. So um, this is, this is uh, the Bauhaus postcard. There are 20 of them. They were from, um, you know, I'd be showing you the originals, except they're up in the show. So um, 
and uh, they were by both masters and students and students who later became masters. So the, the two um, Herbert Beyer ones, these, um, were done while he was a student. And um, there's, there's Paul Clay, two Clays actually, beautiful Clays. Um, Kandinsky, Holy Nash, and so on. And there, um, yeah, if you read the Wired story, it kind of tells the, the story of why they're important. From the graphic designer's point of view, they're fascinating for a couple of reasons. One is that um, they, they um, all had the same text and it's, it's very, you know, as a graphic design case study, right? Um, it says Bauhaus Ausstellung, uh, which means exhibit, and then July through September 1923. And, um, uh, but this was before there was any type at the Bauhaus and before typography was taught. And so this is, a, this is graphic design and lettering. It's not type. None of this is type. Some of it looks typographic, like these, but all of it is lettering because they were all also produced by stone lithography, which meant that uh, the artists were working directly on the stone. It was a skill all of them had learned and um, in reverse. So, but it does kind of feel like, it's interesting because both the early expressionistic um, stuff like more like finding them uh, or clay, but then the buyers kind of prefigure and the Maholinaj prefigure because they were the first and, and um, second typographic masters. Um, they prefigure the uh, kind of mature, better known Bauhaus style. Um, so it was, it was fun to put those together. And um, it, it, it meant that we had some duplicates um, and the duplicates were in the, oh, I have to have something there. It just looks terrible. Um, the duplicates were, were in the, um, uh, the Swan sale and three of them set world records. Um, so, um, let's see, I have a number of things that let's, let me pause for a second and, and see if we can catch up with questions or comments. I think people are really excited. Um, Rob, I haven't seen specific questions, but let's see if anybody comes in with one. Okay. Well, I'll keep going. Um, you know, what I would know, if, if I do another online salon, I'll have the original material under this live camera. And that's kind of a different thing than, than um, what we're able to do now, because the show is over there in the other, it's the show's in another room behind, behind glass. But what I did do is I, I brought some things for show and tell that are related to the story. And, um, and also maybe have um, some uh, kind of collector's interest. Um, um, so, Rob, we do have one um, request, which is, can you show the catalog actually? Oh, show that? oh sure, yeah. Happy to. Um, yeah. Okay, I think that'll open, yeah. So it's, I'm not sure how much of a thing you want, but I'll, I'll go at a certain pace and then scream if it's too slow. So it's, it's red cloth uh, spine. And... Um, also, Rob, if uh, we have a, another request from Diane, 
Um, and if there's any time to address the relationship between Cranbrook and Bauhaus catalogs, print studios, broader ways, that would be lovely to hear. Oh, well, I'd be happy to tell you what I know. It's nothing. I, I don't really know. Well, okay. So who landed at Cranbrook? Somebody from Bauhaus landed there, right? I'm not really sure. I, Albert's landed at um, Black Mountain and then Yale. I don't think he was at Cranbrook. Um, Maholi Naj, of course, started the school in, in uh, so this is, this is Ellen Lupton's essay, which is just really so good. Um, it's not terribly long, but it, it kind of covers all the right points. Um, I also want to point out for, you know, it, this is shameless plug time. Um, so I think this will kind of work if I do this. Yeah, a little bit. Or I can zoom in. Okay. Um, so because we photograph our um, are things, will there be a second edition of the catalog? Um, yeah, I think it seems likely it's selling well and um, there's, you know, it might travel. So um, yeah, I'm not sure I can really show this, but I, I do wanna say, because we photograph the material in house, um, with state-of-the-art state uh, raking light equipment um, and then print it using stochastic screening. Um, it has wider gamut and more detail than um, typical reproduction of this kind of material. So. And we always, um, so it's kind of our house style to um, show the complete object to its natural edges, and um, which ensures that you're looking at a real 3D object, but also that um, uh, you're seeing the full intent of the designer. Because when you, if you square up um, and, and crop, it, it's, and then it's funny how that becomes a slippery slope, but there's, there are a surprising number of books in our field that, that aren't showing you, uh, the full margins. Um, and to us that even like, this is not particularly attractive. It's because of the way the binding works, but it's the way it is. And, and so we kind of try to make it look as real as possible. Um, we're able to photograph and do color management in-house and also contract proofs for press. This is one where maybe, I don't know how the focus will be, but there you can see the texture, maybe. Yeah, um, you can see texture. Yeah, and that's because the raking light captures it. So here's the, here's the clay piece. You know, the book actually has an advantage over the show which is that it's, um, it shows more, um, you know, you see the insides and the, so here's a cover and the, and the title spread of the thing. In the case of the clay, we show, I think this in the case, but now you get to see the cover and three other uh, collages. And so we tried to make the book um, a, a rich and kind of standalone experience. The, the Bauhaus postcards are all at actual size. Um, and there's some fun sort of, uh, this, is, this is, we actually have two copies of this one so that this can be shown uh, in the exhibit. Uh, this copy was sent to Walter Dexel, who was um, one of the collaborators of the Bauhaus. Um, and this is, so this is from Schlemmer, the designer of the postcard to, to Walter Dexel. And then the other fun fact about the show and the cards 
is that every one of them, the lithography on the front says July to September, but there's a rubber stamp that says it doesn't, it didn't open until August. So um, not the first time designers have missed their dates. Um, so in the early stuff is very, it's expressionistic, but there's no type. So it's, it's lettering um, and it's closer to the style of German expressionism, um, but cleaner than that. A lot of the same printmaking techniques, woodcut, hand-colored woodcut, uh, lithography, stone lithography specifically. Um, and, but the compositions are sort of dense and wild rather than uh, the cleaner stuff that we think of later. Um, so there's the postcards, the programs, and the, the catalog of the show. And then Bauhaus publications, so all of the books. and all of the journal. And then the three typographic masters, and in each case work before and after their time at the Bauhaus. So here's, starts with Maholi Naj, then Bayer, This is the this is the publication that reproduces the um, the version of the universal alphabet that we have the board for. Buyer, 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 lots of buyer, and then Schmidt. This is actually so. There's the this is probably the better known. Uh, most often reproduced one with the big red D. Um, Schmidt, Schmidt, Schmidt. And then there's a section called Towards a New Typography, which is this, we actually, this is very constrained. In fact, some of the stuff I, I brought for, for uh, show and tell expands this because there was limited room for it, both in the physical exhibit and in the book. Um, and so, because there, there are probably thousands of pieces that would qualify for, for new typography. Um, and so we constrained it to individuals that had a direct relationship with the Bauhaus of one kind or another. So um, the, the, the folks in question are Jan Chico, who was inspired by the 1923 exhibition to really go in the direction of new typography first publishing this in the periodical in 1925, and then his book, The New Typography in 1928. Um, but all of these people had a direct, so this is Chief Gold. Dexel uh, lived and taught in Jena, and, uh, but was a regular visitor at the Bauhaus, lectured at the Bauhaus, actually designed a program for the first exhibit. Uh, and these exhibition, um, notices are all of Bauhaus artists that he uh, was involved with the museum in Jena. Um, and Max Bill was a uh, student, Bauhaus student. And Piet Zwart uh, also lectured at the Bauhaus. They were well aware of his work and uh, it was highly revered. And then Karl Teige is another one. And so all of these folks had a direct relationship and, and we constrained it to that. Um, and then beyond the Bauhaus is work of students uh, later uh, after their time at the Bauhaus. So Max Bill at, uh, in Switzerland and then at the Ulm School. And um, this is an echo in Japan. This is, this is amazing actually, this is 1929. They're already ripping off the 1927 or eight, I think, um, Maholi Naj, Bauhaus book. Um, 
And then a few kind of echoes in mid-century design, some branding stuff and uh, Elaine Lusted Cohen. This, this Igarashi thing is great. This is um, uh, Takanobu Igarashi, who is a wonderful Japanese artist who makes mostly three-dimensional three letter forms. Um, and for the Aspen conference in 1988, he took Meyer's universal alphabet and did isometric projections of it. And it's printed in hot fluorescence, which don't reproduce quite right, but kind of get the sense of it. It's a wonderful sort of homage piece. Of course, Bayer was still alive at the time and was instrumental, was one of the founders of the Aspen Institute and the conference. Um, and then we show some things that are echoes of the earlier expressionistic work in early digital and grunge. Um, this is emigre, which is their, their archive is here. Um, and then a few, a few modern pieces. Okay, that was probably too much of a book. Let me do, um, go ahead and keep asking questions because I can, I can show and talk. Um, first thing I'm gonna show you is some stuff that's come in since the exhibit, huh? <laughs> Just, you know, for the hell of it. Not even sure these would make the cut. And by the way, there is, there's, you know, a stack of Bauhaus material that didn't make the cut. Um, this is kind of an interesting piece. I'm not sure we know yet who designed it. I think it's Schmidt, but it's um, quotes, or no, it's Maholi. It's quotes print in the press. So it's basically, it's, it's like a press, well, it's a clipping. It's a printed book of clippings about the Bauhaus. So um, I'm not sure exactly how that would translate. Um, but it's clearly, you know, quotes from the press. Nice typography. Um, if we had room for it, I think I would have tried to put this in. And it's pretty early. It's a lovely piece. Yeah. So this one is kind of wild and crazy and and completely out of date range, um, but it sort of continues the theme of the expressionistic stuff, even though this is later correspondence. So these are letters from Carl Peter Roll, uh, who was a student, and there are a couple of pieces in the in the show by him. Um, This is a drawing, a pen and ink drawing by him. And also did the Bauhaus This is by him. This is liner cut. So these letters are from 1951. And they're kind of, you know, he has the, the hand is really quite, it's a, it's a, uh, probably a stub fountain pen nib. So it's a, a little bit calligraphic, um, but they're illuminated. And um, kind of really fun. Not what you'd normally think of as Bauhaus, I suppose. Um, and Rob, we've got, yeah. um, first of all, wow, those are cool. Um, and uh, second of all, um, Hans asked, was there anything revelatory that came out of curating the exhibit? For me, I think the, the, the major thing is the kind of dichotomy between the early hand letter dense expressionistic stuff and the later, you know, cause, okay. So what we generally think of as Bauhaus typography is asymmetrical, lots of white space, sans serif typefaces, um, maybe all lowercase, depending on how radical it, it was. Um, 
dynamic use of photography, photo montage, um, interesting crops, and um, and that really became mid, you know, that kind of flowed into mid-century design, which was in some ways a refinement of it. But it's certainly what most people think of primarily as Bauhaus design. So it's epitomized by mm -hmm. the books and the journal and a lot of the uh, a lot of the stuff in the show, more than half of the stuff in the show, certainly. The, the work of, of all of the three typographic masters, for example. Um, but the early stuff, before there was a typographic workshop, before there was a typographic master, and when all of the graphic design that was done at the Bauhaus was um, printed with printmaking methods. So um, it was either stone lithography, intaglio of some kind, um, or relief. Um, they had a proofing press for, for uh, woodcut and line of cut, but no type. And um, so that, that dichotomy and that kind of grouping of expressionistic stuff, that was the real revelation to me. Um, and as I, because it's partly something that I realized in building the collection. Um, and, uh, and, and also I think we're maybe as an institution a little more interested in that stuff, whereas the other stuff gets all the press. Um, and uh, I don't know, is that, a, is that a good answer? Worked for me. Um, so, and Han says yes. Um, we have a question. So R O H L. R O H L. Yeah. This is this is a kind of a counter example because this was before there was type, but it was just done by a local printer and specified by Maholi. Um, so there was some sort of commercial printing that began to uh, that used type, but but as you've seen, like. You know, the Bauhaus postcards, a lot of the early work of the masters uh, was hand lettered and done with printmaking, printed with printmaking uh, technology. Okay. Um, so we probably have time for just this one more question um, from Karen, um, which is Are there any photos of designers making these artifacts? Ooh. Well, Actually, that was really hard to find. We even had trouble for the book finding a good, um, you know, good photographs of, of the, the shop and the print printing and printmaking facilities. Um, so there are lots of photographs of the of sort of Bauhaus life and especially of the parties. Um, but um, yeah. So is it over at one? Because it was on the calendar till 1.30. I thought the, there was Q&A. Um, we can continue until 1.30, but um, we try to keep it to an hour um, just as a rule. Um, but we do have some more questions if you are OK to continue. Sure, sure. Um, was the Bauhaus focus on lowercase letters connected to alphabet reform in Germany? This is from Robert. Yes, okay, so I'm not sure whether by alphabet reform you mean um, the, the National Socialist typefaces or, because the orthography, okay, it, it was what it, I'll simply answer by stating what I understand it to be, which is a, a um, uh, uh, an alternative to the standard German practice of capitalizing all nouns. And because most other uh, languages that use the Roman alphabet don't do that, um, the Germans had a, a real strong cultural connection to, to it, um, but it fucks up the texture of the typography, something fierce. I mean, you know, it's interesting, languages vary in their incidence of Ascenders and descenders and capitals, and um, the calmer uh, it is, the the more 
sort of beautifully the lines flow. And that's a big reason why like early in Renaissance typography looks so amazing. It's all in Latin and it, that's, that has substantially less chatter visually than English. And then German with caps is just um, at the other extreme. So I think when they, when they did the, uh, the all lowercase idea or the biform, which the universal alphabet, some of the other Bauhaus experiments were, were uh, in that form. In other words, uh, they use some characters typical of upper and lowercase, but it's, it's only one alphabet. And um, that was uh, a, a kind of a German way of doing it as opposed to like only change the nouns and still capitalize sentences. Not sure that last bit of speculation. Somebody, somebody here probably knows better. So um, uh, Robert followed up with alphabet reform, meaning the introduction of Roman alphabet and Stutterland cursive. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, that had already. I mean, that that is a bit earlier, or it started earlier than the Bauhaus and. No, I think the designers who were advocating for all lowercase, um, they were especially vociferous in Germany because of the all caps thing, but it was, it was everywhere. We have, we have um, a fun little artifact, which is a pairing of Vanity Fair magazine in 1928. The first issue that, that uh, uh, MF Aga, who was the art director, uh, tried to go all lowercase and the front manner that explains why they're they're attempting this experiment. And then a couple months later, the first issue where they revert back and apologize. Um, so it, it wasn't only in, in Germany. Um, I will add that in Bauhaus magazine, I think it's um, mag one, but it might be two. Um, they, uh, there's a, like a short piece in it that it explains that um, capital letters are just not efficient. Like you double the amount of characters in your alphabet so that it is inefficient and then yep. has a sort of like down with capitals attitude. Yeah. I'm, I'm ready to answer any further questions. I'm just gonna continue showing things that, that um, have arrived recently. This is um, by Joseph Hartwig, who was a Bauhaus student and probably most famous for designing the Bauhaus chess set. Um, and it's a set of alphabets. It says, one old and four new alphabets. It's actually more. The Roman is not terribly Bauhausy and not really so great, if you ask me. But this is pretty delightful. This is this is sort of um, I mean it's hand lettered, but it's um, has a lot of kind of cobble feel more than Futura really, uh, but an even more exaggerated sort of deco uh, variation in width. Bolder version of that. So Hartwig was a designer in Frankfurt at this point, and this was uh, published about ten years after the battle was closed. I think. I think that deco one is pretty cool. I probably would have tried to squeeze it in. There's no room. There would not have been room. Um, any further questions? I don't know if yes, I... we just got one from um, Puya. Um, sorry if I ruined your name. Did Bauhaus conduct experiments, engagements with non-Latin typography? Ah, no, I don't really think they did. Um, yeah. There, so there was a Jewish community at the Bauhaus um, and a number of the, the masters and students were Jewish. And that's one of the reasons that a lot of the, the uh, 
lot of them became expatriates. Um, and um, so, but but I, I can't really think of anything in Hebrew, for example, that I'm just like going to the obvious possibilities. I've, I've never seen anything that's essentially Hebrew and, and sort of Bauhaus style. So I, I, I don't think that wasn't, they weren't really interested in type design. And when they did get um, type, uh, in the workshop, they had it was a very simple kind of limited uh, uh, set of fonts. Um, Stuf talks about so there's a there's a previous salon which um, Stuf you're here so you can drop a, uh, a a link to your salon about the typography in which uh, Stuf identifies all the fonts. Uh, I'm not going to attempt to to duplicate that, but um, this this literally just came in like a week ago and um so you know it's, it's an ongoing process um, here's another piece that um it's in the timeline in the catalog um it's not so it's in the book, but we had to license it because we didn't have it then. It's only peripherally related, but it's quite famous. So uh, this was the degenerate art exhibit that um, uh, the Nazis organized of basically all the kinds of art they didn't like, um, which included you know, anything foreign, anything abstract, um, most expressionism um, and of course it was like the most popular exhibit in germany of the time um, kind of backfired in that way um, it's not bauhaus typography or anything it's kind of more the counter example but um, there is some bauhaus work represented in it um, so it's a it's kind of an important artifact in fact this comes around all the time and it's not very you know you know, 50, 100 euros should do it. Um, there, there must have been a lot of copies of it. Um, and this is something that we found at the book fair in Oakland last week or two weeks ago. The first actual dealer fair for two years. Um, this is more Bauhaus related. The designer is Kiesler, and uh, but it's sort of a, a classic of new typography. Really a beautiful piece. surprisingly rich in typographic treatment. A lot of these things are, you know, either they have a great cover and there's nothing of interest inside, or, uh, you know, a lot of the spreads are the same. But this is just full of kind of unique typographic treatments. There's great too. All right, well, um, Um, we have one question from Hans. Um, has anyone done a translation of Kunst that you know of? Oh my, I don't think so. Um, one of our publishing people would know that. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Sorry. Um, Well, well, thank you so much, Rob, for sharing all of this um, new material. It's exciting, um, exciting for those of us on staff as well um, to know what has just come in. Um, we've got one, another question from, I hope I'm getting your name right, Puya. Um, uh, you go to a fair when you, oh, great. I am getting my name right. Thanks. Um, do you plan to find, 
Do you plan to find items? Any tips about non-pro collectors to go um, when deciding about pricing? Yes. Well, you know, I didn't actually uh, talk all that much about process, um, except indirectly on some of the, the major pieces, and that's not really typical. So your specific question is about book fairs. And we, um, we don't like to pay retail. So we work with dealers, but not as often as maybe a lot of our peers do. So I'm trying not to, to you know, say this in a way that gets awkward. Um, Priya also says any other uh, other context. I think the question is largely like, how do you decide about um, pricing? Like, what are you offering? What's a high bid? What's a low bid, et cetera? Yes. So um, basically, um, let me just answer the book fair specific question because it's an interesting one. Because we don't often work with dealers, the opportunities we look for at book fairs are things that are either unexpectedly bargains because usually the it'll be retail rate everywhere but that's not always the case and and so you're looking for things that are with the wrong dealer or you know kind of market anomalies um if you care about price um and but you we a big part of it is just discovery because you get to see a range of things that you haven't seen uh, or maybe you haven't seen in person yet. And so it's worth going to a book fair, even if you don't buy anything, because you'll learn so much. And um, so that would be the book fair advice. The more general sort of collecting strategy, there's kind of three major channels now. It was very, very different when I started without the internet. Back in the day, it was it was a very analog physical process. You were literally spending your weekends at estate sales and driving around to, to weird used bookstores and um, you know just finding what you could. And there were specialized dealers who um, were useful. And, and I did buy more from dealers back in the day. Uh, but the, the internet kind of um, uh, in, in economics, we would say it perfected the market in the sense that market knowledge is now broadly available and, and way more complete. Um, and so there are basically sort of three ways that you can find this kind of material now and uh, not counting in person, basically, like three sort of internet ways, because I think that's um, in a lot of ways the most productive. Uh, the first is uh, used bookstores and antiquarian dealers. And um, the aggregator for that that we recommend is called Via Libri. And the reason we like it is because it basically aggregates all of the, the national and uh, or most of the, uh, the sort of specialized book trade aggregator sites from different countries. Um, but it even includes um, not very well eBay auctions and, um, and Amazon listings. And um, so it's a way to, to see how many copies of a thing are out there and what the price range is at retail. Um, it's very market driven. If I'm a dealer and I find a thing and I go on the internet and there's no other copy, well, I'll just ask whatever the fuck I feel like to see if somebody bites. Um, and you'll find that happening. Sometimes dealers who are either ballsy or less experienced will price way beyond the market. You see this on Amazon too, just in, in case somebody's stupid enough. Um, and, and, but sometimes it works and sometimes you find the market value um, by starting high. Um, but if I'm a dealer and I, I acquire a thing and I go on via Libri and I find out that there are 20 other copies and they vary in condition and price and there's a range and well, I'm gonna price in that range. I'm gonna to try to do it appropriately to the condition of the piece in question. And uh, 
I'm uh, I'm gonna um, pick my position in that range based on how quickly I want to turn it over. Um, if if I really want it to move quickly, um, and certainly if it has any kind of condition issue, I'm going to price it at or below the lowest price. And so there's this kind of continual uh, market impact on things for which multiple copies are available at the same time. Um, for that reason, that's a really good strategy to acquire stuff up to about, I don't know, three to $500, I would say, because the market is already keeping the dealers honest. And if there's enough selection online, um, it's, it's, it's by far the most convenient. It eliminates a lot of the hassles of auctions. And um, uh, it's just simpler and, and more appropriate for, for most material. Um, and then there are the things that are not currently available online. And the way you measure rarity, in my view, on those things is how often do they come around? Are they in the market five times a year or in the, are they in the market once every five years or every 10 or every 20? Sometimes you look up the auction records on a rare thing and it hasn't come around for 20 years. Um, and that's a really different situation. Um, we generally try to stay away from it because uh, it's probably gonna be setting record prices. Um, so the aggregator that we happen to use for auctions is called Invaluable. And they list a lot of auction sites and they allow you to uh, bid through them um, and you know, save items of interest so that you can track the price movement on things. Um, and uh, you can also pay extra to get search alerts and things. Um, and um, that's for live auctions. That's for what you think of, you know, the kind of auction you see in a movie. There's an auctioneer somewhere, they're on, on invaluable, uh, and on some of the other aggregators, um, there will be the video feed of the live auctioneer. Um, and, um, and so it's happening in a particular moment and all bidders are competing at, at, against each other when that lot comes up. Um, the other kind of auction is a timed auction, which was invented by eBay and there are others um, that are regional. Um, eBay has a kind of buy it now uh, or make an offer component, which is more like um, uh, just basically dealer listings of another kind. And that's one of the reasons that the Via Libri is trying to include them in results. But it, as I say, it's not, not so good. Um, and um, there's quite a lot of material that's just out there available on eBay. Um, and it's, it's great for things like periodicals and other things that are uh, flowing relatively uh, uh, steadily and are at price points in the you know, 10 to $50 range, that kind of thing. You'll see it's the best place to like complete a run of a periodical. Um, and um, especially if, you, if you're in a hurry um, or aren't necessarily looking to start with a chunk of it. Um, so those are basically the three things. There, there are dealers and the dealer aggregator, uh, dealer aggregators, there are live auctions and, and the sites that aggregate those. And there are timed auctions, and, and those sites are also kind of dealer aggregators uh, uh, on the buy it now side. Um, one of the things that is that when you open an institution and if people like you, they start to give you things. So we actually buy a lot less than we used to, especially in volume, um, because we're, we're the community has just been really supportive and generous and and um, a lot of the things that we might have been trying to acquire previously are are sort of steadily coming in um, via donation 
there's a whole class of material. Like nobody, nobody's probably going to donate something like this. Or if that happens, it would be, um, uh, you know, sometime in the future and part of a major something or other. You know, um, but you know, fill in issues of periodicals and and reference collections that they don't have room for and stuff flows through here at a remarkable rate and actually um, our duplicate flow is pretty great um so i guess um thank you um thank you Scott. Uh, my lunch just arrived and I, I'm teaching a three hour workshop in half an hour. So I, think I was just going to say thank you so much for this and um, you've been very generous with your time and for your with your um, information so thank you very much. Um, thanks everybody for joining us. Rob is there any last words. No, thank you so much for for coming today. Uh, I hope we get to greet you at the archive itself sometime soon. And, um, and I hope that it was useful on the dimensions you cared about. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And we will see you at the next event, which is next Tuesday, um, March 1st. Thank you all. Bye. Thanks, everyone.